I grew up in Indonesia in what used to be called Dutch New Guinea, the big island above Australia. And in that time, it was very primitive where my parents worked. They went into an area first where there was an established mission station and where other missionaries had uh, paved the way. And so there was already the ability to learn a language that someone else had put into writing and to interact with people who had already become believers in Christ. And then my father, along with other missionaries, expanded out into other territories. The name of our mission was Regions Beyond Missionary Union. It's this commitment to take the gospel where they didn't have an established uh, New Testament or Old Testament, didn't hear the message of the gospel yet. And so my father, along with other missionaries in other parts of the country, stepped into those uh, far-flung areas. And dad went into a place called Corapun and built an airstrip there with Bruno De Leo, and then began to learn the language and translate slowly at first, but as time went on, translate parts of the Bible and share the hope of the gospel with people who were very primitive. You know, there was cannibalism. If you could get a body back to your area, you would eat the body. Uh, women were property that were owned, as were pigs. And so it was a very uh, different kind of social environment. We had a great time. There were certainly scary moments, you know, when you step into the unknown. That's scary in its own right as a child. But as adults, perhaps a little more scary because you're more aware of the things that could go wrong. You recognize that when you're in a land where you're not the local person, where you're the outsider, uh, and where those people are warlike, and there are dangers involved in uh, the possibility that somebody could decide that you don't belong here. I do remember times when I was afraid, certainly. When we got off the airplane at Korapun, they had a welcoming committee for us, and they ended up circling us and coming around and rubbing pig grease on our faces. And it was a little alarming. Multiple times, people were in our front yard, really, uh, exchanging uh, insults and unpleasantnesses about whatever had happened that had provoked uh, each other, and then began shooting. And it was a little bit like dodgeball, you know, you a little posturing, arrow on the bow, pull the arrow back, and then suddenly arrows are pointed and flying, and people backing away and shooting at each other, and and uh, and then someone gets shot, hostilities cease. Uh, so we've had people brought up to us to deal with the the arrow that, that was in the person or you know coming for help. I saw my parents interacting and responding in those situations with an effort to bring peace, but it takes more than just stopping hostilities to bring peace. And so the message of the gospel was that not only God would forgive you, but it changed your life and allowed you to forgive as well. And seeing people accept that message of hope for themselves and then take on a sense of urgency about conveying that to others has been one of the more rewarding things about mission work. When people can say, God changed my life, it's a powerful message to give hope to others. I know God can change your life because he's changing mine. We saw people offering forgiveness, people burning their bows and arrows, people committing to live at peace with each other, as well as offering to share that hope with people around them. When I was in seventh grade, I was out at the boarding school and my father and Stan Dale had decided that they would travel between Korapun, where we lived, and Ninya, where Stan Dale lived, with the idea of building another mission station. It took about seven days to walk that transition between the villages. When they traveled through there, they recognized there was some risk. Stan Dale had been shot traveling through that area before and nearly killed. And he had recovered from that, continued to preach the gospel. The local folks who had come to the Lord were preaching the gospel and seeing others saved. During that trip, my father and Stan Dale were followed and then shot and killed uh, in that transition in the Singh Valley. We first heard about that because they didn't answer the radio. And then ultimately, folks came in by helicopter to that area and saw the wreckage of hundreds of arrows and some uh, remnants 
Bible, glasses, a boot, and then found that the men had been killed and eaten. We heard multiple variations of that story. At first they'd been killed and eaten, then that they hadn't been eaten, and then later that they had. Whatever the truth of that, as a child, I don't remember that being of particular concern. Once someone's killed, of course, there's nothing that the body does that it makes it something you can preserve. Uh, my mom was comforted by that verse that says, after they kill the body, what can they do? You know, that's not where we'll be. We'll be with the Lord. But it did trouble her, this thought that her husband had been eaten. Uh, when the report came from the team that had gone into the same valley, I didn't want to go down into the living room to listen. It was in the Taylor's house. I uh, didn't want to go down and listen to that in front of people. And so I crept over above the fireplace where there was a gap in, in the floor there and the ceiling of the, the living room and just listened from there. Uh, just uh, self-conscious of the overwhelming, sen this sense of loss and not wanting to display that in front of people. At the same time, there is this certainty that God was at work in whatever was going on in life, not just in our lives, but there is an eternal purpose to what happens in the world. There was the fall that has catastrophic influence on the way life is, and that had touched us in a really tangible way. And yet at the same time, that didn't shake my or my family's, as far as I know, conviction that God was real and he had positioned us for an eternal purpose there for that time and place. Uh, but after my dad died, Costas particularly went out of his way just to reach out and encourage and affirm me, uh, inviting me down to his mission station to be a part of working with some projects that he had going on, not because I had anything particular to contribute as a kid. Uh, he just recognized that I needed somebody who just quietly invested. He didn't give big speeches, uh, it wasn't big hugs. He just roped me in. And anyone who knows Costas, you know, big laugh, big hugs, just intentional about reaching out and embracing people. So relational, so gifted in sharing the love of God. So intense at, at the same time about his faith. So, uh, so certain of the fact that God was calling us. In memory of my dad and Stan Dale, the people where we lived had put up a monument. They wanted to be very clear that this was not worshiping the stones because there were fetishes in their culture where artifacts had spiritual significance. They wanted to be clear that this was not worshiping the stones. It was a marker to say, this is where the gospel came to our valley so that just as in those piles of stones that the children of Israel put up, the next generation would say, why is that here? And the older generation could say, this is where the gospel came. There's that interesting story. The people in the Yali Valley called themselves people at the end of the world or people at the outer part of the world. They don't have a conception of the sort of civilized view of the globe, but they saw themselves as people at the edge of the world. And so when that verse was translated, it's a simple message. The gospel came to the Jew first, and then to another people group that they didn't know. And from there to Philip Masters, and from there to us. We're in there to the people at the uttermost parts of it. It says that we're in there. God had a plan that to the Jew first, then to the Greek, then to the people at the uttermost parts of the world. God had a purpose from the very beginning that we would have a part in this. When they finally got in writing in their own language, the New Testament having that delivered in the response of the people who were praying that they would live to see this with their own eyes. The, the gospel in their own language is really a blessing. When we were landing to join my dad in Korapun, they had decided that we were just people after all and not spirits, 
and that we were outsiders. And so they said they decided to kill us. And then we got off the plane and mom was wearing a red dress. And one of the chiefs thought that that was an omen, a bad sign that was blood. And they passed the word, don't kill them. We were spared something then that my dad wasn't spared later. And so to trust that it's in God's hands when and how these things happen and to trust that he has the ability to redeem those things that don't work out like we would hope or pray. That God protects in many different ways and it's not always through circumstance or safety physically. One of the guys who'd been a part of the group that killed my dad had become a pastor. And so a chance to meet him and just to see how God had transformed his life. When I look back on my growing up years, surrounded by people like Costas and Alki McCreese and the Taywans and just so many others, my parents among a whole host of people who God called to step out of their comfort zone and to go to places where they didn't have a strong support system and where there was risk involved and, and where there was some cost to the family as well as to the people making the decision as adults. But I watched people, normal people, not saintly people, not people that put on airs or thought of themselves as in some way special because they were missionaries or pastors. Just people faithful to do whatever it was that God called them to do. And when that meant going to some unusual location or speaking boldly to people who weren't sure they wanted to hear it, or when it meant just living a very simple life when you could have had an affluent life of ease. I saw them being faithful to what God called them to do. What an impact for me and then for generations of those who heard the gospel. How will they know unless someone tells them? And so there's a ripple effect through eternity for every person who speaks the truth in love, who shares the hope of Christ, who lived, who died, who was resurrected, and who will come again.